Okay, so I just want to thank everyone for joining us. I'm Emily. I'm one of the event hosts here at Howells. Um, and just before we begin, I want to encourage you to check out the out our lineup of other upcoming events online at powells.com. Please remember to follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, and you can sign up for our weekly events email at powells.com. Tonight, we're very honored to welcome Michael Ian Black in conversation with Maria Konnikova. Michael is an actor, comedian, screenwriter, award-winning children's book author, essayist, memoirist, and podcaster. That is an impressive list. <laughs> uh, he's written and starred in many TV shows, including The Slate, and his podcasts include Mike and Tom Eat Snacks with Tom Cavanaugh, Topics with Michael Showalter, How to Be Amazing and Obscure. In A Better Man, a mostly serious letter to my son, Black offers a thoughtful and personal appraisal of the complicated meaning of masculinity in our times. Based on both personal experience and thoughtful observation of the rapid changes that are taking place in our society, he searches for the best way for his son and for all the boys of the rising generation to navigate coming of age and becoming more evolved men. For today's fathers, he asks and seeks the answer to a difficult question. How can we be and raise better men? So he'll be joined in conversation by Maria Konnikova, the author of New York Times bestseller and critics pick The Biggest Bluff, among other bestsellers. She's a regular contributing writer for New York, The New Yorker, uh, whose writing has won numerous awards, and she also hosts the podcast The Grift and is a visiting fellow at NYU School of Journalism. So this event also includes a Q&A. If you have questions, please put them in the Q&A module in the bottom of your screen. If you don't see the Q&A button, please check under more. As well, if someone else has typed a question that you'd also like to know the answer to, please consider upvoting to make sure that that question gets asked. Uh, and perhaps most importantly, please consider supporting both Michael Ian Black and Powell's by purchasing a copy of A Better Man. I'll be sharing a book to a link to buy the book throughout this evening. And now please welcome Michael Ian Black and Maria Konnikova. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for hosting me. And thank you so much, Maria Konnikova, for agreeing to have this discussion because you're busy you're a busy woman you got a lot of shit going on and it means a lot to me that you took the time to do this particularly because look you're up there in vermont it's after eight o'clock at night uh that's bedtime as far as i'm concerned that's bedtime so cheers to you you peer pressured me into getting some wine so here we are I'm so glad my peer pressure worked and I'm thrilled to be here. Um, I don't want to be anywhere else. Um, Michael, your book is absolutely phenomenal. Um, everyone who is joining, please, please buy a copy. It is all that and more. Um, I wasn't quite sure what to expect. I mean, a letter to your son, but I think this is one of the most of the moment books that I've read in a very long time. And as we both know, books take a long time to make. And so it's crazy that you happen to capture so many themes that are, that are in the kind of zeitgeist right now. And you've clearly written it earlier before we were able to see what it, how it turned out to be. So, so the book is phenomenal and, and it's also hilarious, which is what I would expect from you. So let's, I have, I have an, serious question to start the discussion. But first, I have a question that was just on my mind the entire time, which is, which Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle were you? Maria, it's a great question. And I'm glad you opened with it, because it's probably going to be top of mind for most people. I did drop out of college to become a touring Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle. Uh, there was a stage show called the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle coming out of our shells tour which traveled the country in the early 90s when the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles were kind of at their height. I was not in that stage show. I don't sing, I don't dance. Uh, it was mostly dancing because everything was pre-recorded, but I, I didn't do that. But they were looking for people to move, travel ahead of the touring show to do promotional stuff for the show. And they had secured one, uh, one or two, two of the costumes from the movie. 
So these were big, like animatronic servo filled robot heads in very tight, heavy uh, costume that you would parade around in. They were meant to be worn for about 15 minutes at a time because any, any longer than that, you would overheat and die. We, my friend Ben and I, who got this job, routinely would wear it for like an hour, hour and a half, two hours at a time. And I'm not answering your question yet because look, people are on the edge of their seat wondering which turtle were you? But I remember we were invited to participate in the Macy's Day Parade on Thanksgiving. And I thought, well, that's really cool because it's the Macy's Day Parade and that's kind of a once in a lifetime thing. You get to march in the Macy's Day Parade. Because the thing is filled with gears and servos and heavy machinery, because it operates like a robot, remote control, it's heavy and all the weight of it rests right here on your nose. And the parade route must have been two hours from soup to nuts. And I was, I remember, and we, we, we did like a choreographed number, like in, in front of Macy's that wasn't choreographed because we didn't dance and we didn't prepare really. And by the end of it, I remember I was literally in tears because I was in so much pain marching down the Macy's Day Parade, like waving like an idiot to the, and crying while I'm doing it. Um, and let me tell you who would not have cried in that situation, Raphael, which is who I was. Wow, that was, you that gasped. was the best answer. You that was gasped. the, I gasped, I gasped. I mean, look, that was some great storytelling right there. Um, and all that and more in this book. Um, but <laughs> No, that's that's amazing. So my actual question to to open this book, even though your Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles adventure is amazing, is to talk a little bit about the origins um, of the book, which are a little bit more serious, um, but I think really important. <laughs> so, yeah. So it, so let's um, let's segue from from Mutant Turtles to mm -hmm. the actual reason that you decided to write this letter to your son. It's hard to say what the exact origin was because it's ideas and thoughts that I've been that have been sort of tumbling around in my head for many years. The immediate precipitating incident was the shooting at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Florida. My kids, my son was a senior in high school. My daughter was a sophomore in high school when that happened. And I had been railing about gun violence for years before that, since the Sandy Hook shooting which occurred about half a dozen miles from my house when my kids were in elementary school. And I'm, and I'm sure, and I talk about that day, I opened the book with that day and the terror of that day and the uncertainty and the kind of hopelessness of that day. But after Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, um, I remember I was in the kitchen and my daughter was doing homework and we were kind of watching the news and I just, I just was, I was just so mad and upset. And um, I just went on like a Twitter tirade asking to me, what was the, what was the, it was the first time I had asked this question. First time I'd even thought about it. And it was so obvious that I was like, why isn't anybody talking about this that I'm aware of? And the question is, why is it always boys and young men who are pulling the trigger? Why is it always males? And it seems so dumb to even ask the question because you go, well, of course it's guys. Guys historically always commit acts of violence, gun violence, physical violence, sexual violence. It's always guys, not always, the vast majority. So I just went on a little Twitter tirade about just asking that question, what is going on with our young men and boys, specifically in relationship to this. And then out of the blue, the New York Times contacted me and they were like, do you wanna write an op-ed about this? And I was like, not really. Like, I don't know anything about this. I just, I'm just, you know, a jerk on Twitter. And they were like, we think you should write an op-ed about it. And of course my ego is like, well, then I'm gonna write an op-ed for the New York Times. So I did. And I, I really was like reluctant to do it and kind of afraid to do it, but I did. 
And that got traction to my surprise. And then a publisher asked me if I would write a book about it. And again, I was like really reluctant because I'm like, I'm not an expert in this. I really don't know anything. I'm not an academic or a historian or a journalist. I'm the college dropout who was once Raphael, a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle. Like I'm not qualified. And my wonderful editor, Betsy Gleek, you know, just asked me a simple question, which is, well, if not you, who? Like, why not you? You have a son. You're a guy. You have an audience. You've written books. Like, why not? And I thought about it, you know, and I, I really, I took my time. And when I thought about like, well, I'll, I had purchased a cookbook not that long before that. It was given to me as a gift. And I don't really, I rarely read cookbooks, but I was reading this cookbook. And this is what it said. And I used it. Epigram, is that the word? The, when you, the thing yes. before the book? Epigram. I should know that. I'm a, I'm, a, look, I'm a published author. I should know that. This is what it said. This is from Cal Petronell's 12 Recipes. It was with a little surprise and a little shame that I realized my eldest son was only a summer away from leaving home for college. And I hadn't taught him or the other kids how to cook. And I remember reading that and thinking, shit, like maybe I could take this moment to teach my son how to cook a little bit. Yeah. And so I agreed to do it. That's beautiful. That's, that's really wonderful. So the book is, it's a letter to your son, but in some ways it's also kind of the scholarly treatise on the concepts of no, masculinity. It's not. It is, it is. Throughout, I mean, throughout history, you really talk about how, how the concept of masculinity has evolved, what it means, what it has meant, um, what it should mean. Mm -hmm. um, I'd love to talk a little bit about kind of this I, I don't want to call it a dichotomy because there are more than two things there, but kind of this divide between the traditional masculinity and some of the good things that you do take out of it mm -hmm. and this concept that you don't like, and neither do I, so I'm glad you don't like it, of toxic masculinity. And then this, what I term, I don't think you use this term in your book, aspirational masculinity, hmm. kind of what, what you think that masculinity could be. I think this is kind of one of the themes that is interwoven in the book. So do you want to talk a little bit about kind of these, these different conceptions of what it means to be a man, especially in the United States today? One of the first things that I had to ask myself, and I think a lot of men wrestle with, which is, the answer to the command, be a man. I relate the first time that I heard that in my book when I was very young, um, but it's a familiar- It's state. terrifying, it's terrifying. I'm sorry, if I had a huge lab in my face, a I would be- A labrador retriever, not like a chemical lab, but yes. Right, a labrador, a labrador retriever in my face, I would be petrified. Well, yeah, but I was like four years old and, and a dog basically would, giving me love and attention, but I didn't know. I'd never, we didn't have a dog when I was growing up and I thought it was killing me. And I started bawling and, you know, and I, I wouldn't stop, I would not stop. And, you know, somebody, it was at a party, um, a dinner party that my parents had taken us kids to and somebody said something like, come on, be a man. And it wasn't like mean, it wasn't like they were chastising me, it was just like what you say, you know? And I wasn't aware, like at the time, like, well, what the hell does that mean? But it's, a, it's such a familiar statement. And now on Twitter, like when I would talk about this issue, like I'd say like, you know, I'm writing this book about being a man or men, man, and, you know, men. And, you know, inevitably a Twitter troll would be like, what do you know about being a man? And I'd be like, I know, why don't you tell me? Tell me what it means. And people can't, men can't. There's not a good acceptable definition or any definition really of masculinity 
except that what's so weird about it is that there's a language of masculinity that everybody is fluent in, men and women. And so like I'm holding, what kind of wine do you have? You have red, red, red wine, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yes. So I can tell you, and I think you would agree, like every single thing in our lives can be measured according to what's more macho than the mm-hmm. other. In the book, I describe it as the infinite access of manliness. Red wine is more macho than rosé. I don't know why, but you're agreeing. <laughs> I am, but your glass is more macho than mine because your uh, glass yes, is like a whiskey glass. because mine looks kind of like a whiskey glass. Right. I um, mean, yours is more of a traditional exactly. wine glass, even like a sherry glass, maybe. Mm. Um, but we all speak this language of masculinity, so we all know kind of where everything, literally everything fits on that axis, but nobody can use that language to define masculinity. So that was the first challenge. What is masculinity? And what I sort of plucked out is that masculinity is, and this is going to sound dumb, like is the, um, the attributes of manhood. I mean, it sounds like a kind of dictionary definition, but it's helpful because you go, okay, well, what are those attributes? And when we talk about traditional masculinity, like you mentioned, there's a few that immediately spring to mind. Strength, endurance, independence, um, you know, grit, whatever you want to call it. And for a brawn, for a long time, like that paradigm could be really helpful. Mm -hmm. And was helpful and in a lot of ways continues to be helpful. Um, and we know it's, we know these are good attributes for no other reason than we now encourage all of our girls to embody all of them. We talk about strong women, brave women, independent women, and we, and we hold those women up as feminine ideals right now. But those same attributes in men are kind of being denigrated um, because there are times, many times, when those same attributes can kind of cross over and become destructive, corrosive, and dare I say, Maria, toxic. Um, so in terms of aspirational masculinity, I am not somebody who is interested at all in reinventing masculinity or overturning masculinity. Instead, like we've done with girls who have expanded femininity to include these traditionally masculine attributes, I want to do the same work for men and expand masculinity to include and elevate traditionally feminine mm-hmm. attributes, creativity, empathy, nurturing, vulnerability. Um, I think that answers your question. It does. And it's such a wonderful way of putting it because one of the things that you stress over and over is that it's all about humanity. I'm I mean, wasted, by the way, I'm, I had <laughs> two tablespoons and I am. Oh, wow. <laughs> all right. Well, that's very macho. Muy macho. Muy macho. Muy macho. <laughs> so one of the things that you stress is that it's about humanity. It's mm-hmm. about the fact that we're all humans. Yeah. And yet, so many of the ways that we relate to each other aren't as human first, but right. as let's slap these labels on each other first. Right. And of, and of course we do that. I mean, our brains are programmed to separate, mm-hmm. to do pattern recognition. You're a girl, you're a boy, you're black, you're white. And you, know, you sort of assign these categories and that makes perfect sense. But at the same time, once you do that, I talk about how my wife and I, when she was pregnant with our first child, our son, we deliberately didn't like, we didn't want to find out what the sex was. Yeah. A lot of make people make that decision. For us, we thought, oh, it'll be fun not to know. You know, it'll be a surprise. Little did we know, like when you're in labor, like there's plenty of surprises. Like you don't need, to, like it's surprising enough, you know? <laughs> but so we didn't know. And so the first, the very first thing that happens when you have a baby 
is the doctor holds up the baby and announces what sex it is. And in the moment, like, you don't think about it. You're like, oh, yeah. First of all, in the moment, like, you don't care. I didn't care. It was like, you know, the baby's alive. Thank God. The baby's breathing. The baby's crying. The baby's doing whatever the baby's supposed to be doing. Thank God. Oh, it's a boy? Okay. But immediately when that happens, the way I describe it in the book is like all the possibilities that you had in your mind when the baby was just the baby sort of cleave in two. It becomes mm -hmm. narrowed by half. You don't do it consciously. You're not like, oh, well, then the baby, you know, our boy isn't going to wear, you know, pink clothes or whatever. But you do it subconsciously. And your brain automatically fits into that pattern. Boy stuff, girl stuff. No matter, I don't care who you are. I don't care how progressive you think you are. Mm -hmm. Your brain is going to do that. And that's okay. Like, I'm okay with that. But then I think there is sort of next step, next level thinking, which is what I think I'm trying to get to and what the culture has already arrived at with women. And where I think a lot of people are trying to get to with men, which is the idea of thinking of women as full spectrum human beings. And now to get men to think of men as full spectrum human beings and understand that we are different. We're in, different as individuals. I think there are biological differences between men and women. I couldn't tell you what they are, but, I, but there's certainly like a, I mean, there's some obviously, but um, you know, there's a bell curve of sort of normal, not normal, average uh, female and male attributes. And most of us are somewhere, you know, on the higher end of this bell curve. But there is definitely overlap. There is definitely, you know, sides, sloping sides to each of those. We are never one, we are not one thing. We are all kind of gender fluid in one way or another, all of us. Um, and we all share the same stuff of humanity. We are all full spectrum humans. And the sooner we can sort of break out of these archetypes, which aren't, and the problem is they're just not serving us very well mm -hmm. right now. So from a purely pragmatic point of view, if we can get ourselves out of them, I think we'll all be better off. I couldn't agree more. And it's, and it's also a beautiful moment where you juxtapose the, the birth of your son and the it's a boy moment with uh, you having to cut the umbilical cord and this feeling deeply process. ambivalent about that. Yeah, it was, it was, I, I wasn't prepared for it. Like nobody said, you're gonna have to do this. Yeah. And the doctor says, do you wanna cut the umbilical cord? And you know, as the guy in delivery, like you're useless, you're <laughs> worse than useless, you're annoying, you're in the way. Um, but of course you wanna be there. And of course, and thank, you know, thankfully you can be there now, like it's allowed and encouraged. But so, so they're like giving the guy a task. They're like, well, you get to cut the umbilical cord. And I'm like, and you know, my first thought is like, ew, like I don't want to do that, that's so gross. But he hands you this thing. And because you're a guy, because you've been programmed to sort of accept these challenges, you're like, well, I can't tell the doctor, I think it's grody. So you're like, yeah, of course, I'd be honored to cut the umbilical cord. And I cut it and it, it's like squishy sausage casing because that's basically what it is. But then later, like in thinking about it, you know, I'm thinking like this child has been attached to his mother for these nine months, literally attached, living from her and with her. And my very first act as a father is to separate them. My very first act is to sever a connection. And it just seems so heartbreaking to think about that. And to think about, you know, of course, the baby <laughs> needs to have the umbilical cord cut, of course. But there's something so mournful about that, yeah. too. Um, and, you know, I'm glad I did it, but I also, I don't know, it, 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 it felt really sorrowful in retrospect. And I, and I wish that hadn't been, like, my first act as a parent was to, like, separate child from mother. Well, it's a, it's a beautiful passage. And I mean, you talk a lot about kind of the earliest days of boyhood and also of girlhood because you're also the father of a girl. Um, and so it's, it's, 
I'm glad that you bring her up at multiple points because at the very beginning, I had written out kind of a question for you, which is, you know, well, where's your letter to your daughter? And then I was like, oh, okay, it's in here as well. Mm -hmm. um, and there was one, there was one passage earlier in your book um, after the birth of your son that stood out to me. It's if you if you want to follow along, it's on page seventy, um, and it's about how early sexism and these different definitions of gender, how early they start. Mm -hmm. um, and so it, it, this was also a very funny passage to me. It's one of the strange things about parenting both a boy and a girl is realizing how early sexism starts. Um, this is your joke. So if you want, you want to, read me to it, I can read it. Do you, want me to read you, it? Can, you can take over from me. Yeah. You just tell me when to stop. I used to tell a joke in my act about how when people met my infant son for the first time, they'd tell me how handsome he was, et cetera, et cetera. But when they met my infant daughter for the first time, inevitably somebody would say, she's going to be trouble, which I always thought was weird because the trouble they were implying she was going to get into was sexual. They meant it as a compliment, I guess. But when they said, she's going to be trouble, all I heard was, she's going to suck a lot of dicks. That's a good place to stop. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> stop on the punchline. Smart. Stop on the punchline, because that is the punchline. And it's so true. When I read that, I actually recognized it and thought, wow, and I don't have any kids. I have nieces and nephews, but no children of my own. And I recognized that this is actually what we do both as men and as women. Women do this Absolutely. to little girls. They yeah. say she's gonna, you know, oh, she's gonna be trouble. Mm -hmm. Like with a smile and that and that yeah. intonation. Like she's gonna be pregnant by the time she's 11. Like <laughs> what, what are you talking about? <laughs> so it was really, it's, it's an interesting kind of dynamic where we do have these toxic masculinity concepts but then we also have these crazy expectations of females and they don't at all mesh. And it's just kind of this brain fuck in a way. Like, what are we supposed to do? Right. Uh, I mean, if you're, if you're asking, I don't know. I am. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, here's what I say about it. The, the next paragraph yeah. talks about this a little bit. It does. You can go on. I just wanted you to stop at the punchline. Because that was a great place to stop. <laughs> girls are sexualized in a way that boys are not. Once girls hit puberty, the culture begins treating their bodies as objects of fascination and desire. Those cultural cues don't just come from men, by the way. Open up any women's fashion magazine and look at the ads, Gucci, Dior, Versace, whatever. The clothes in those ads are all exorbitantly expensive. $1,700 blue jeans, $2,500 handbags, clothing practically no young woman can afford. But who's modeling it? Teenagers. The adult women who read these magazines are looking at aspirational photos of girls. The other ads in fashion magazines are for youth serums. It's perverse. Girls are rushed into young adulthood and then asked to remain there, suspended in adolescent amber for decades, and it's true. Um, and I think, you know, there's complicated reasons why it's true, all of which we inherently understand. They have to do with, um, you know, it, 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 in essence, it's sort of at, at root fertility and the idea that a woman's worth is measured by her ab ability to create children and, uh, from a kind of status way, her ability to um, serve as a accessory for a guy and the deal that she gets historically in return is protection and uh, motherhood and, and, a, a, and a place in society because for so long, a woman's place in society was as a mother. And the way that she, you know, got her bona fides was she's a mother. She didn't have a career. She didn't have that opportunity. She didn't have that option. But those stereotypes aren't serving us well either anymore. Because um, women now are succeeding in the larger culture, professionally, personally. Obviously, the women have their own issues, but... Um, 
they're accelerating through the culture at a rate that is surpassing that of men, pretty much by most measures. Women are just mm -hmm. taking off um, because they've been unleashed over the last half, half a century, 50, 60 years. You know, the spark was ignited. This stagnant half of our population has finally been given voice and opportunity and empowerment and self-agency. And men are kind of watching them go like, what? Like men are just like watching this take off and, and not keeping pace. It's not that it's a competition. It's that when you see everybody's, and everybody meaning men and women, when you see their potential and women finally realizing their potential, the mediocrity, the inherent mediocrity, inertia in men is kind of going, oh fuck, like I didn't know we had to do that. Like I didn't know we had to study. I didn't know we had to go to like take school seriously. Like my place in society is supposed to be assured. Mm -hmm. And now we're competing with 50, 100% more, uh, math is not my strong suit, 100% more of a talent pool. And then you include like the minorities that are giving, finally being given more opportunities, like seizing those opportunities and white men, which is really who this book is addressed to. And I'm very careful to say that it's really, it's from a white straight dude, it's for a white straight dude, or to a white straight, I wouldn't say for, but to a white straight dude. And we're left as white straight dudes going, wait, like I can't like rest on my own mediocrity. And I don't even mean mediocrity as a put down. I really don't because I think most of us, the vast majority of us are inherently mediocre, we're average. But when you have to compete with a much broader talent pool, the exceptional people are gonna take those jobs from people like me who are fairly mediocre. And you go, oh shit, like I need to do something. And, the, and one of the things we need to do is figure out how to be better men. Mm -hmm. not, not just because it's better for our relationships and it's better for our mental health, like just to put food on the table, like we have to be better men. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's very w well put. Can I ask you a question? Yes. Uh, speaking of, of this, because the world of poker, which you have spent a lot of time in the last few years, is a traditionally very male environment. I do think that's changing. I think it's more welcoming. But I'm wondering what your experience as a female professional poker player has been in this regard. Um, at the beginning, not great. Um, so professional poker is still 98% male give or take. I mean, sometimes you'll see a field that's 97% male and the event organizers will say, yes, we knocked it out of the park. We've got 3% female. This is amazing. And a lot of people have asked me how, how it is. And at the highest levels, it's amazing because you have some of the smartest, most incredible people in the world who are at the height of professional poker and they are welcoming, they're nurturing, they're, they're everything you want to be. They're wonderful. And they are huge advocates for women and they supported me and they were the best cheerleaders. I mean, my coach was male, Eric Seidel, and he was you know, one of the strongest feminists and supporters of me that I could ever imagine. He has two daughters who both worship him. Mm -hmm. he's, he's, I think, like, he would read your book and nod his way through the whole thing and say, yep, yep, this is right. And yet at the lower levels, I think there's still so few women because as you get into it, you still, it's a, still a boys club. And you how, get, does that, how, how does that manifest itself when you're sitting there at the table? So a lot of times you just don't feel welcome because they don't want to watch their language or what they're saying or how they're treating the dealer because the, mm -hmm. the dealers are Oftentimes women, they don't want me to judge them when they're hitting on the dealer and trying to get her to give them her number. Um, and they don't, they don't want to watch that type of behavior. They're there to have fun. And at the lowest levels, and by lowest, I just mean people who are kind of the ones who are there for recreational fun reasons, people which is like, the games. I'm like a lowest level person. And I, and I understand perfectly what you mean. You don't mean like lowest level in terms of like humanity. You mean like no. lower stakes poker. Exactly, exactly. So like I come into a casino and I sit, you know, at the $30 tournament or the one-two game, kind of the lowest stakes they have. 
there are people there who are just there to have fun. So they just don't want to acknowledge that it's not a boys club, that there's a female at the table because they've never had to. Right. And they've always been able to do and get away with anything they wanted. So I've been called everything. I've been hit on. I've been propositioned, like actually given a dollar sum price for my services <laughs> and said which hotel room I could accompany them to. Oh. This all happened. Um, and I called the floor. So the floor is the management of the casino in that last situation. And they said, we're sorry, he's a really good client. We're not going to, we can't do anything. Um, and so it's, a, it's definitely a pervasive culture and I hope it changes. But I do think that I want to give your book to all of those men. Unfortunately, I think they throw it away after looking at the cover because that's the problem, right? A lot of people don't want to hear your message. That's why you get so much shit on Twitter. And a lot of people say, well, who are you to tell me what kind of a man to be? So it's, I mean, what does it feel like to actually like try to beat this message down and say, look, you know, I'm, yes, I, I can't tell you, but listen to me. How do you well, do one of the great ironies of writing a book like this is knowing full well as you're writing it that the people it's meant for will never read it. Knowing full well, you know? Yeah. Um, and, and accepting that and going, it doesn't really matter. That, and this answers your other question too, I think, which is, I'm not out to change the world. I don't think I'm capable of changing the world. Um, I don't want to have a soapbox. I, I'm not a celebrity advocate for shit. But what I do think I can do is be one small voice in an emerging conversation. And I think that's enough. Like, I yeah. think it's enough to be one person trying to do some good, or at least yeah. what I think is good, and having the conversation hoping that it affects another person and another person. And you go one at a time. I don't think this is, I, I don't think the conversation about masculinity is going anywhere anytime soon, which is why when you introduced it, you're like, it's such a timely book. I'm like, yeah, cause it's always going to be a time, mm -hmm. you know, this shit isn't going anywhere anytime soon. I think it's the work of generations and having that perspective on it, I think is helpful for me. Not that my book is going to be around for generations, but that this conversation, which I really feel like is starting to kind of percolate. Yeah. Um, I think this conversation is going to, is going to be ongoing for, for generations. And it won't hope... stop, by the way, but, but it, it will never stop. But I think to get to kind of, to sort of catch up to kind of where the move, women's movement is right now, yeah. I think that will take generations. I, I hope so. I hope that it will actually get there and be a conversation for generations. I actually hope it will take less than generations, but I don't think, I don't think so. I think you're right. But one of, the, one of the just sentences, two sentences from your book that really struck me that I think is relevant to this, is you say the three most difficult words for a guy to say are not, I love you. The three most difficult words for a guy to say are, I need help. Mm -hmm. And the irony, of course, is that the people who need the most help will never say that. Right. at least in this moment. And to me, it's, I mean, that's part of the tragedy. That's part of the reason why you wrote the book. And I think we can even go a little bit back in time. You know, you, you talk about kind of some of the immediate, what's the plural of impetus? Impidi? Impetuses? Sure, with impidi. Impetuses. Impidi. Okay. impidi. Impidi sounds better. Than impidi impetus. sounds great. Um, you had the immediate impidi for your book. Um, but you also talk throughout the book about your dad and that relationship. Um, I'd love for you to, to talk a little bit about that because he grew up in a very, very different time. My dad is a product of um, the 1950s, 60s. Um, his dad was a New York City cop in Queens. He, I think his dad was first generation American, Jewish, Russian American. And, uh, my dad grew up in New York City and, and, and was a New York City kid. He wasn't brash. He wasn't, you know, hey, I'm walking here. He wasn't that guy at all. But you could tell he was a product of his environment and he was reserved and he was quiet and he was unable to express emotion 
and unable to relate to children, including his own. He was a kind man and a bookish guy, and I think a pretty sensitive guy who couldn't, who I don't think ever got to where I am now, which is to say, comfortable enough in my own skin to express what I need to express. My parents split up when I was five because my mom got into a relationship with another woman, um, the woman that I grew up with, my mom and, the, and her partner. Um, my dad died when I was 12 from the, 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 the circumstances remain a little bit mysterious, but ultimately I think it was, I think it was a blood clot that killed him um, after, after a, a, a traumatic brain injury. Um, but what sucks so much about it, in addition to losing your father, was when he died, I was just getting to the age where I felt like we were starting to communicate a little bit. Like he could kind of relate to me and my older brother. And I have a younger sister who has Down syndrome. And he could relate to especially us boys a little bit better. And I was just starting to feel like I was getting to know him. And I was, you know, entering that part of my life where I was becoming an adolescent and I kind of needed a male. I needed a man in my life. And I wish I'd been able to have a conversation or at least observe him kind of more as a man or as a young man looking at a man just to see what I liked and didn't like and just to sort of understand his version of masculinity better. And so, you know, as I wrote this, I became gradually aware that I was writing this as much to him as I was to my son, that I was having this conversation with him uh, as much as I'm having it with my, with my son. It seems like you're also having the conversation with your mother mm -hmm. in, a, in a strange way, even though she's obviously female, but she also had a very different conception of masculinity, which I was very interested to, to read about in your book, um, that it's not necessarily true that just because you're female and enlightened in one way that you actually are willing to accept the full spectrum of what it might be like to be now. No, and my mom died now three years ago after a long illness. Um, and I have a lot of, and we, were, and we remained close her whole life. And I have a lot of sympathy for my mom because of what I know she went through in her life. But when she and her partner got together, it was like, you know, we were talking about the women's movement sort of taking off like a spark. In a way, that was true on a very micro level with my mom. She had been very sheltered. She had been um, whatever career opportunities she had seen, or not opportunities, whatever career ambitions she had had for herself, she felt were thwarted. She wanted to be a lawyer. She didn't feel like she could. She didn't feel like she had the support or the encouragement. She you know, left school and she married my dad, had three kids. And I think always felt very stifled. And then she fell in love with this woman. And it was like all of that came out of both of them at once. They became ardent, what they called feminists. And I think they were feminists. But it's like they almost became the caricature of feminists that anti-feminists look to. Because they became, for I think a lot of good reasons, very sort of vocally anti-male. Um, and I wish that wasn't true. I wish I could say like they were good examples, um, paradigms of feminism, but in a lot of ways they weren't. They would routinely denigrate men in the presence of the three boys living in their home. My older brother and the woman I call Elaine had a son as well, who was a year older than me. Um, and, you know, routinely call men assholes and um, male chauvinist pigs and talk about their sexism and la di da di da and you'd be like yeah like I you know I'm sure I'm sure you're experiencing that like I'm sure you're experiencing that but when the message is always what assholes men are it's impossible not to absorb that as a young man and go wait are you talking about me <laughs> like it's hard not to sort of internalize that and I did 
for many, many, many years. I still have it. I still have it. I've always trusted women more than men. I've always mistrusted men when I first meet them. Um, my closest friends growing up were always female. Um, I just relate better to women, I think, for this reason, that I, I just have a hard time putting my trust in men. And it took me a long time to just be like, we're not all terrible. Like, there's good things about us, and we do good things, and we're, we're okay, and we're worth, we're worth celebrating and preserving and, and sympathizing with and supporting. And, you know, certainly when I had my own son, that felt true. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that these are, these are themes that we can all relate to, male or female. Because I, I think, I mean, I, you know, I get like, the more I learn about what women go through in relationship to men, the more sympathetic I become and the more tempting it is to kind of write us off, you know, even for myself, like I feel that, I really do. But I also have, particularly having written this book, tremendous sympathy for boys and men and understanding the other side of it and understanding, I think in a deeper way than I ever had before, not what enables or allows bad behavior from men, but I feel like I have a lot of sympathy for the position that men are in and the confusion that we experience as men in terms of how to relate even, not only to the other sex, but to each other. Yeah. You know, it's the, 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 the profound experience of being a man, I think is one of being alone and in a lot of ways scared. Like masculinity is at, in, in many, many ways about terror. It is about erecting incredible defenses so that you never have to confront your own vulnerability. But the vulnerability doesn't go away. It just gets sublimated against everything else that you erect to guard it. Women have the space to talk about their fears and insecurities, to lean on each other, um, to share with each other to whine and bitch and complain to each other. Men don't really have that in the same way. And as a result, I think a lot of men feel really isolated. It's why a lot of men don't have friends. Yeah, no, I, I, think, that's, I think that's very true. Um, I have lots of other questions, but we also have lovely questions from some of the attendees. So I'm going to switch and ask a few of those and then maybe we'll have a few minutes for me to yes, ask a few Cooper's more. A good kisser. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So so here's here's a good one. So for fathers who've been raised in a traditional macho home with a lot of yelling and a lot of aggression, what tools do you recommend when you find yourself dealing with your kids in tense moments and realize that those embedded patterns are being cross generationally repeated? So I also grew up in a house with a lot of yelling and anger. My mother's partner was the way I describe it, a rageaholic and was always on edge. That rage often spread to my mother. It was a very tense household. And I can't, I, I, all I can tell you is how I deal with it and dealt with it as a kid. As a kid, I just withdrew. As a kid, I just withdrew. I became morose, depressed sarcastic, you know, and, you know, was all the, all the things that teenagers are normally, and that got enhanced. As an adult, um, I think the best advice I can give, and keep in mind, like, I'm not an expert on this. Like, I'm not a parenting expert. I'm not a marriage expert, but I've, I'm a parent, and I've been married for 21 years. Um, and we bicker like crazy. God, do we bicker, my wife and I. Jesus, <laughs> it's horrible. But we also make up and we also laugh together and we also have good conversations and we also are each other's best friend. When I find myself retreating into old patterns, and for me, that pattern is withdrawal. 
the best thing I can do is to try to listen, to try to hear what she's saying, whether it's my wife or my kids. I don't yell at my kids. I never have. Um, I mean, I have occasionally. Um, but so much of, of, of what I feel like ails us, and I know it sounds simplistic and stupid, and maybe I am simplistic and stupid, but I feel like so much of what ails us can be ameliorated with non-defensive listening. And the non-defensive part, I think, is really important. Because listening doesn't just mean waiting for them to finish so you can tell them why they're wrong and why they, you know, and to score your next point. It, it, it means just trying to hear what they're saying and process it without being a dick about it. And believe me, that's hard for me. Believe me. And I am not always successful at that by any means. But when I'm able to hear and reflect back what the person is saying, things tend to go a lot better. Yeah, I think that's, that's an important skill for anyone. I can't help, I need, I need to slide one of my own questions um, in here because of something you said. And it's something that you write about a little bit in the book which is that one of your kind of original defenses towards this was sarcasm and kind of this comedic shell. And in some ways that was the origin of your career. Oh, and you it know, was entirely the origin so, of my career. So I'd, I'd love for you to just talk about that tension a little bit that, you know, would you, would you be a comedian? Would you have done what you did without some of these tensions and kind of Pro some of these probably mechanisms? Not. I never intended to become a comedian to begin with. I sort of fell into it in college when I helped to start a sketch group called The State. Um, but one of my first popular characters on that, tele what ultimately became a television show, was called The On-Air Personality, which was this smarmy, sarcastic scumbag. And I was able to do that really well because I, in not intuitively, I understood from long experience kind of, what being sarcastic and sort of being able to say outrageous things and get away with them and, and with a kind of like detachment, emotional detachment, I, I understood that. That eventually became a kind of persona that I did a lot on like this, I love the 70s, 80s and 90s, which was this VH1 clip show where I would just say very deadpan things about whatever cultural event was going on. And I became very successful doing that. I made a fair amount of money doing that. I mean, look at these, look at these gorgeous bookshelves. Beautiful. Uh, beautiful bookshelves. But at a certain point after I got married, before I even got married and before my son, my first child, my son was born, I started to recognize that it wasn't serving me emotionally, that it wasn't, I couldn't keep doing it. I could have kept doing it professionally, but it, it didn't feel honest. And it felt like I was growing, you know, it, I, 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 I felt like I was, I was getting bigger than that. Not ego wise, not successful wise, <laughs> emotionally and spiritually. I was outgrowing it. I couldn't keep doing it. Um, and I had to change and I had to figure out how to adapt. And I had to figure out a way to mesh who I actually was or who I wanted to be, my own aspirational masculinity with my career, with my comedy. And ultimately, I really believe like professionally, I think it was bad for me because it, it was very easy, I think, to be that guy and I could have kept being that guy and I could have marketed myself as that guy, I think a lot easier than just being a guy who's in touch with his feelings, like who gives a shit? You know what I mean? Like what's the comedic angle on that? And it's been a struggle, but it's been worth it to me because I feel like it preserved what in me I wanted to preserve. And, you know, honestly, I still have the bookshelves, so it's fine. You do, you do. And they're still beautiful and they're perfectly positioned for Zoom. So, so I, I feel like it's a success. A lot of trial around. and error on the Zoom. Excellent, excellent. Um, so uh, I will now go back to audience questions, especially because this is a question that I love because you quote Beyonce in your book, which is wonderful. Yeah. And so this question says, you quote Beyonce, where she says she wants to teach her son the things that boys aren't typically taught. 
things like emotional intelligence. You say the people who need to hear the message most, men probably won't read the book. So it doesn't matter if it's a mom versus a dad teaching young men a new way to think about masculinity. No, of course not. You know, one of the things, one of, I mean, I hate using this word just because it's just so like academic and stultifying, but one of the characteristics of the patriarchy is that it's not only men running it, it's women too, you know? It's, it's women who are invested in it because they, it serves them and it's what they know. You know, another word for patriarchy is just status quo. It is kind of what is, it's what they grew up in, it's what they know. Um, you know, I wrote a long Twitter thread, not long, I wrote a Twitter thread today because Tony Lauren, what's her name? That conservative woman, young woman, um, wrote a mocking like derisive tweet towards at Joe Biden when it was something like, he said like, wear a mask. And she was like, you want a purse with that? And I was so like annoyed and irritated that she said it because it was a perfect example, as I said, of why I wrote the book. It's not just men who are contributing to shitty masculinity. It's women too. Um, and it's not, it's because it's what we've all been raised in. It's what we know. It's what is in a lot of ways comfortable. And if we want men to be better and men to feel safe in trying to do this stuff, in trying to like say the words, I need help, they need partners who are women who are gonna help them along the way and support them. Um, I'm not advocating that men walk around weeping all the time and that we are open wounds, eternally exposed to the radiation of the world. I'm not saying that. I do think and continue to say strength, endurance, independence, all great attributes. And men and women should embrace those attributes. But there are going to be times in your life, in everybody's life, when you fall down and you try to get up and your fucking ankle is twisted and you need to be able to raise your hand and say, I need help. And if you have people in your life who will extend your hand without calling, extend their hand without calling you a pussy about it, I think you're really, I think we're all gonna be really well served for that. I think so too. And I think that those are beautiful words on which to end our hour together, even though I had lots more questions that I didn't get to. But for everyone here, um, First of all, thank you, Michael, for, for doing this and for sharing your thoughts with us. And everyone else, please do buy this book. Um, it's a wonderful read. And there are so many great thoughts and a lot of wisdom in it um, that, that really, I think, will help future generations, or at least I hope will. I hope that the people who need to read this book do read it, um, if only as a hate read. <laughs> so well, thank you thank you michael or Raphael, as i will yes. now call you um maria thank you and uh, for those of you who are watching and have not read the biggest bluff which is maria's book ostensibly about poker but really about life and decision making i would encourage everybody to read it. it's one of my favorite books of the year maria's a brilliant writer and please uh, read it thank you Thank you both so much. That was amazing. That was really great to listen to. And I hope people took a lot away from that. I know I did. Um, thank you everyone out there for joining us. And yes, please do buy both of their books. Uh, you can visit us online at powells.com. I've got uh, the links to both of them in the chat there. Um, and we hope to see you at another event soon. Until then, have a good night, everyone. Thank you so much, Emily. Thank you. Thank you.